Thank you. Good morning, please, Dan. Dr. Jim Young Kim, Secretary Cesar Purisima, Secretary Florencio Bad, Secretary Corazon Juliano Suleiman, Secretary Laila de Lima, Secretary Maroa, Secretary Joseph Emilio Bayam, Secretary R.C. Balisacan, Secretary Edwin Lacerda, Senator Almendras and Cesar Villanueva, Representative Maria Lenor Robredo, Ombudsman, Ombudswoman Conchita Carpio Morales, the BSP Governor Amado Tetanco Jr., Ambassador Joey Quisha, delegates from the World Bank Group, partners from the business community, international and international organizations, fellow workers of government, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, again, good morning. First of all, let me thank Dr. Kim for his generous words inciting the transformation that has taken place in the Philippines these past years. Let me be the first to point out that these are the achievements of our countrymen. It was the Filipino people who gave us the mandate for change back in 2010 on the principle that where there is no corruption, there will be no poverty. From then until now, our people have been the reason for the Philippines' success. That is why we in government have worked steadily to ensure that they go from achievement to achievement, from empowering our people through social services, health, and education, to leveling the playing field and fostering an attractive atmosphere for investments and the jobs that they create. The famed belief of former President Ramon Magsaysay encapsulates this perfectly, that those who have less in life should have more in law. At the same time, I also believe in another part of President Magsaysay's credo, which states that the healthy impatience should be among the characteristics a president must have. I would put it this way, it is not enough that we act. The duty of government is to act and to do what is right to do what benefits the vast majority of people at the soonest possible time. You can just ask any of my cabinet secretaries about my own healthy impatience, which some of them may describe less kindly. <laughs> Coupled with a memory that is greater than an elephant. <laughs> All jokes aside, this impatience has led to my preoccupation with constantly innovating and improving the way we serve the Filipino people. We can never be satisfied with the status quo. It is with this belief that we have always evaluated ourselves and revisited programs and policies to ensure the utmost efficiency in rendering service to the Filipino people. This is the only way that the Philippines can continue on its upward trajectory and reap the benefits of the reforms that Dr. Kim cited earlier. This is the fastest way we can move forwards, uh, move towards rather the vision we share with the World Bank, a future of true inclusivity and equitable prosperity. The first status quo we had to disrupt was that of government trapped in a vicious cycle of inefficiency and corruption, where the budget was full of leaks, allowing unscrupulous officials to steal money from the Filipino people. After all, we share the World Bank's belief that the key to winning the war against poverty is nothing less than sustained and, and inclusive economic growth, and that no country has ever won the war against poverty without addressing corruption and weakness of economic institutions. As such, in 2011, we took on the task of shoring up the budget, of re-evaluating the systems and processes we had inherited in order to plug the leaks. After all, the Philippines is a country with limited resources, and we needed to ensure that all our resources were being maximized to serve the people. We embarked on a, a re on a review of existing programs in order to weed out those that were not serving the country and those that were merely being used by the corrupt to line their pockets. Each and every item in the national budget came under scrutiny. For each project, we asked one question. How does this benefit the Filipino people? Doing this, however, led to reduced government spending. This, combined with the economic downturn the world was facing, led to a slowdown in economic growth. We were fully aware of the dangers of doing nothing. I am told that for every peso we spend on infrastructure, another peso of output is generated in other sectors. Imagine the billions of pesos in infrastructure that went unspent. The impact on the economy would be magnified, and that is only for the short term. We are not even considering other factors, such as the time and the fuel costs saved through improved, improved road systems, the jobs that would be lost also in the long term, among other things. 
The cost of underutilizing existing resources is measured not just in pesos or percentage points. It is measured, I think more importantly, in the amount of empty stomachs, the number of jobless people, and the loss of opportunities for those in the margins. It deprives the people of benefits now and diminishes future benefits for the entire country. We had to act. We knew that if we were to bring about inclusive growth sooner rather than later, we needed to be proactive and pump prime the economy. We chose to do this through a management tool now known as the Disbursement Acceleration Program, or DAP. In July of 2011, right before my State of the Nation address, I received a progress report from each department of the executive branch. Through these reports, we discovered that, for one reason or another, there were programs and projects that were moving very slowly, if at all while others were able to accomplish their goals much more quickly. Some agencies were able to use their budgets effectively, while other agencies were not, whether because of legitimate reasons or because we had suspended their projects to investigate leaks or anomalies. Of course, the question arose, what would happen to the funds that were not being used? What would happen to what some would term savings? Before I go on, perhaps I can clarify. And I said this yesterday, but in any household, savings are always good. They can keep, be kept for a rainy day or for an emergency. In government, however, savings are almost always bad. They are the equivalent of programs and projects left unfulfilled of foregone benefits for the Filipino people. Given this, we had the decision to make. Should government be content to leave these funds idle? Or should we find a way to put them to good use, to put them in service of the Filipino people? It became evident that the latter opinion or option was the only option we could consider if we wanted to stay true to our mandate. With that, I asked my cabinet what projects they would be able to implement and what they could not. We agreed that if agencies could not maximize the use of their budgets in the mid-year review, then we would allocate them to progr programs that would bring benefits to our people in the soonest possible time. This is precisely what we did under the Disbursement Acceleration Program. Two of the projects that were funded under that I spoke of yesterday, the construction of classrooms and the electrification of an additional 2,110 sitios or small communities across the archipelago over the earlier target of 4,053 sitios. Allow me to speak to you about a few more of them. Over 50% of the 144 billion released under the Disbursement Acceleration Program went to three critical agencies. First, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or the Central Bank. Second, our Department of Public Works and Highways. And lastly, the National Housing Authority. The new Central Bank Act of 1993 mandated a 50 billion peso recapitalization for the Central Bank of the Philippines. Under the watch of then President Ramos, an initial capitalization of 10 billion pesos was provided, but a 40 billion peso deficit remained unfulfilled until my administration came into office. We filled that deficit. 10 billion pesos under the General Appropriations Act and the remaining 30 billion pesos under the Disbursement Acceleration Program. This has empowered our central bank to perform its functions fully for the benefit of our economy. Of course, under the able stewardship of Governor Tetanko, we had very high confidence that this would all be achieved. Over 33 billion went to the Department of Public Works and Highways. It was used in the construction and rehabilitation of roads, bridges, flood control projects, and other critical infrastructure across the country. This helped boost the growth and effectiveness of industry. It made it easier for tourists to reach favored destinations. It helped make the Philippines a more attractive destination to investors. This we did under that. Through programs implemented by the National Housing Authority, 700 homes in safe areas were provided for the former residents of North Triangle, Quezon City. 21,175 housing units were completed, with 3,742 more units still under construction for families living in danger zones in the National Capital Region. In Iloilo, families living along the Iloilo River benefited from 1,000 housing units and a total of 2,498 housing units were also built for the uniform personnel of the Bureau of Fire Protection and the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology. Under DAP, 
11 million pesos went to giving these Filipinos safe homes. And there were many more projects. We renovated hospitals and health centers and upgraded their equipment. We hired nurses and midwives and deployed them to areas where they were most needed. We expanded the coverage of our flagship conditional cash transfer program. We bolstered livelihood projects, preserved key tourism and heritage sites, and strengthened our weather forecasting abilities. We also improved the facilities of state universities and colleges and empowered our youth to join the workforce through the Training for Work Scholarship Program. Under that, we were also able to completely settle a debt that past administrations had incurred. We released 3.46 billion pesos to pay the balance of unpaid GSIS or government pension premium payments. These unpaid premiums had kept almost 800,000 teaching and non-teaching personnel in the Department of Education from receiving their just benefits. Now, these personnel can receive their pensions and access the full benefits due them, including loans for their children's education. Only a minimal portion of DAP releases have, have any issue. And rest assured, the Commission on Audit will ensure that if there was any abuse or misuse of this fund, then those responsible will be held to account. The full details of the programs that were implemented under DAP were released last night and can be accessed to the official Gazette website, which is www.gov.ph, or can be found in this particular address. The most compelling statement that has risen above the din and clamor surrounding DAP has been this undisputed truth. DAP was good. Neither the Supreme Court nor our most vociferous critics have made statements to the contrary. In a report entitled Philippines Quarterly Update from Stability to Prosperity for All, released in March 2012, the World Bank itself stated outright that DAP contributed to economic growth. And it did so in the best way possible, funneling billions of pesos in savings back into the economy through programs that would directly and immediately redound to the benefit of the Filipino people. On top of this, it also had a positive signaling effect to the private sector. In 2011, after the slowdown, growth was only at 3.7%. After investors and businessmen saw how quickly and efficiently government moved to address this, they gained confidence to invest in the country, and the numbers do speak for themselves. In 2012, growth was at 6.8%. I have to ask, can the same effects be attributed to DAP's previous incarnations? My predecessors all had their versions of DAP, called the Reserve Control Account and, alternatively, Overall Savings, which were used in part to respond to the Asian financial crisis and the fiscal crisis. I should add, these former presidents also exercised the authority to transfer appropriations or savings no, to other branches of government and even to constitutional commissions. Perhaps we are being questioned today simply because we have been truly transparent about it. In the interest of transparency, allow me to share why DAP is perfectly legal. Let us look at the Administrative Code of 1987, specifically Book 6, Chapter 5, Section 38 of the Administrative Code, which states, and I quote, except as otherwise provided in the General Appropriations Act, and whenever in his judgment the public interest so requires, the President upon notice to the head of office concerned is authorized to suspend or otherwise stop further expenditure of funds allotted for any agency or any other expenditure authorized in the General Appropriations Act, except for personal services, appropriations used for permanent officials and employees, close quote. We did not base the legality of DAP on this provision alone. Again, same book, Chapter 5 again, Section 39 of the Administrative Code states, and again I quote, except as otherwise provided in the General Appropriations Act, any savings in the regular appropriations authorized in the General Appropriations Act for programs and projects of any department, office, or agency may, with the approval of the President, be used to cover a deficit in any other item of the regular appropriations." Close quote. Furthermore, Book 6 again, Chapter 5, Section 49 of the same. Administrative Code states in part, and I quote, "...savings in the appropriations provided in the General Appropriations Act may be used for the settlement of the following obligations." incurred during a current fiscal year or previous fiscal years as may be approved by the Secretary in accordance with 
rules and procedures as may be approved by the President. Subsection 9 states, priority activities that will promote the economic well-being of the nation, including food production, agrarian reform, energy development, disaster relief, and rehabilitation. Subsection 10, repair, improvement, and renovation of government buildings and infrastructure and other capital assets damaged by natural calamities. Close quote. At first, we were be bewildered by the decision of the Supreme Court. They said that that was a policy well within our rights to implement, and more importantly, that it did good. What is the logic of saying that that redounded to a lot of good, but in the same breath saying that as a method it was bad? From their point of view, we can understand why the Supreme Court declared certain portions of that unconstitutional. After all, they did not so much as look at the Administrative Code of 1987, which I should add is still constitutional in its entirety. The Supreme Court decision is deeply unsettling, not only because our honorable justices failed to take into consideration all our legal basis for that, but also, and more importantly, because the ruling will have a chilling effect on our economy and consequently on millions of Filipinos. For instance, following the Supreme Court ruling, armed Governor Mujib Hataman made the difficult decision to suspend the implementation of all projects implemented under DAP. These projects include health centers, agricultural facilities, and other social services that would have redounded the, to the benefit of the region, which has, as you all know, battled inequality and poverty for the longest time. Governor Hataman was exercising prudence, which is only right. Excuse me. At the same time, the situation in arm reflects the potentially devastating effect that the Supreme Court decision will have across the Philippines. Out of prudence, I have ordered the suspension of programs and projects funded under DAP. With their decision, it seems as if no government official can be confident in bidding out programs and projects when the threat of a lawsuit hangs over their heads. Thus, the infrastructure projects, essential social ser services, and other programs funded under DAP had to be suspended. Eventually, we may be able to find the funds for these projects. It would entail going to Congress and requesting for supplemental budgets, an already lengthy process that may be even extended by obstructionists and oppositionists. In the short term, the decision will have the effect of once again slowing down government spending. In the long term, it removes our flexibility to act effectively in response to changing market conditions and seize or even create opportunities in doing so. It condemns us to a spiral of inefficiency, uncertainty, and lack of confidence. This is indeed a shame, especially when we have come so far. Imagine, from 1990 to 1999, our average GDP growth was 2.8%. From 2000 to 2009, it was at 4.5 percent. Under our watch, from 2010 to 2013, it shot up to 6.3 percent. They say that for a country to lift itself out of poverty, it is necessary to have a growth rate consistent at 7 percent or more. We are getting there. Unfortunately, the effects of the Supreme Court decision run the risk of putting our country's development in a state of paralysis, or worse, reversing the massive progress we have already made. This is not acceptable. Ensuring that essential services reach our countrymen is not just part of the mandate of the executive branch. It is part of the mandate of every branch of government. I find it difficult to accept their decision when I know that we are right. And more importantly, that doing nothing means depriving so many Filipinos of opportunities to grow and prosper. I find it difficult to accept the decision of the Supreme Court when it goes against the benefit of our countrymen. In fact, I believe that any reasonable person confronted with the same dilemma would come up with the same solution or even better, or even a better refinement of what we did. I chose to run for the presidency to accept the challenge to do so, to do my part in moving the country further along the path to progress. And I cannot support any ruling that severely limits government's capacity to serve its people in the quickest manner possible. I am certain that this audience, composed of development experts and leaders of industry, can agree with me. Let me make it clear. 
I bear no grudge or ill will against the Supreme Court. That is not why we have consistently expressed our opposition to the ruling or why we have decided to file a motion for reconsideration. In pursuing this course of action, we subscribe to the long-held belief that public office is a public trust. Trust given us in the form of a mandate that we in government, whether in the legislative, executive, or judicial branches, will always work for the good of the country. In pursuing this course of action, we remain cognizant of our responsibility to find ways to uphold public order. A collision between the executive and the judiciary might require the intervention of the legislature, and we do not want this. We want to work with our co-equal branches of government in serving the Filipino people. That is why I still hold the hope that our colleagues in the Supreme Court never forget that as they display the legal prowess and acumen that has served them well in their long careers, these abilities must also serve their 98 million countrymen. After all, good governance is not, it's not just about putting an end to corruption. It is also about finding ways to accelerate the development of our people. In this, each branch of government has no other goal than that which the World Bank and Dr. Kim share, which is, and we also share, which is to end poverty. In pursuing this, we stand firm by our determination to ensure that the Filipino will continue to reap success after success, that the marginalized will be able to take stock of their lives and leave the margins once and for all, that businesses will thrive, and that the Philippines will finally realize its vision of lasting and inclusive growth. After all, the be-all and end-all of government is to uplift, uplift our countrymen. And I cannot, in good conscience, sit idly by when government's ability to empower them is jeopardized. I thank you and good day.